Well, hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me out there. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2015 webinar series, and we'll be focusing on an exciting area for us, uh, or mainly jobs for change. And specifically, we're looking today at engineers without borders around the globe. We've developed the webinar today in collaboration with leaders from institutions at EWB Australia, EWB USA, and EWB UK. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I am currently working at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, as well as with E4C, where I'm a senior program manager. In addition to that, I'm also a longtime member of Engineers Without Borders USA. I've been working with our New York professional chapter, both in the capacity of president as well as a committee lead for over six years. So I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Jobs for Change. So at E4C, we're constantly asked the question of how to professionally enter or transition into the field of engineering for global development. We know that engaging with local EWB teams is a proven starting point. EWB chapters worldwide all share a similar mission, to partner with disadvantaged communities to improve their quality of life through education and implementation of sustainable engineering projects. In today's webinar, we we'll hear about the unique approaches taken by EWB Australia, EWB USA, and EWB UK in preparing engineers for these careers in global development. Joining us today, we have Julian O'Shea, who is the director of the EWB Institute of EWB Australia, Skip Spensley, who is the education director at EWB USA, and Doug Harper, the CEO of EWB UK. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Along with myself, we have Mike Mater of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, and Jackie Halliday of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thanks, Jean. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide. Webinars at engineeringforchange.org. So just a little bit before we move on to our presenters about who we are. Engineering for Change is a global community of over 900,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists working to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide. These challenges can include access to potable water and electricity, effective healthcare, improved agriculture, and sanitation, just to name a few. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and information from all the members of our coalition, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. And you are already representing that community. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the E4C webinar series. This free publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field. Information on our upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on our website and also on our YouTube channel. Both URLs are listed here. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. It's listed here, hashtag E4C webinars. Our next webinar will be in September at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard, and our topic will be off-grid energy solutions, the role of services in driving adoption. Check out our E4C webinar page for updates on our speakers and registration details. If you're a member already, we'll be sending you an invitation directly. Another reason to join. So, a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, we'd love to see where everyone is from today. On your WebEx uh, platform, you'll see a chat window. It's located to the bottom right of your screen. And I invite you to type in your location now. 
I will go ahead and type in mine so you guys know where I'm from today. I see some folks from Pennsylvania, from Brooklyn, San Diego, Indiana, Texas, Boston, <laughs> all over the United States I see coming in here. Thank you so much for joining us. New Jersey, our neighbors here from New York. Very great. So thank you so much for joining us from all over. Oh, Egypt. We have Egypt on the line. Represent. Very cool. Thank you, guys. It's great to see you all here today. We really appreciate you joining. Um, please note that if uh, the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon in the top right-hand corner of your screen. It seems that most of you have found it. Very good. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. Feel free to also send a private chat to our Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have. Well, you, you guys are killing this chat. It's great. <laughs> During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions to the presenter. That way we can make sure to keep track of them and nothing gets lost. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, PDH, for the session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C webinars webpage. And we have shifted our page a little bit recently uh, in advance of an update, so also feel free just to send us an email and we'll provide you with instructions should you not find them. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for typing in your locations. With that, I'm going to actually move to our first presenter. And it's my pleasure to welcome Julian O'Shea, who's the director of the EWB Institute, uh, the Education, Research, and Innovation Division of EWB Australia. Julian is a humanitarian engineer interested in the role of technology and design that can play, how the role of technology and design can play in poverty alleviation and community development. He has worked in projects all over the world and in his role leads Humanitarian Design Summit, which are human-centered design programs for technical students. Outside of work, he's an adventure traveler and has visited over 140 countries. We should all be so lucky as Julian. Uh, over to you, Julian. Um, G'day everyone, um, really wonderful to join you. So thank you for taking the time to, to dial in. Um, I'm here in lovely Melbourne, Australia. Um, and yeah, I work at Engineers Without Borders. Um, so we've only got a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna just kind of dive into it. Um, but before I do, I'll just do a little bit of my background. Um, I'm an electronics engineer by training. Um, and I've come to Engineers Without Borders through the education team. When I was working as a professional engineer and when I was a student, um, I really loved the kind of learning aspect, um, but just thought it could be a bit more better and a bit more interesting. Um, and Engineers Without Borders in Australia is around 13 years old, um, but right from the start, one of the core things that EWB Australia has done um, has been in the education sector. So working with universities, with academics, and with students um, on creating an engineering degree that's more community focused, has a more humanitarian edge, um, as well as kind of the focus on sustainable and community development. So that's kind of going to be one of the lenses that I look through um, as we talk about jobs for change, um, looking at career and professional experiences. Um, because my part of the organisation's got that research and academic focus, um, I'll talk about what some of the career options there, as well as a broader discussion about where um, some of our members, some of our um, uh, engaged individuals have gone on to with their career. Um, so EWB Australia um, is a member and volunteer organisation. So the way that we're kind of structured um, is we have a national office, um, the organization size is around um, 10 to 15 paid staff, a um, combination of full and part-time staff. Um, the organization has a turnover, just to get a bit of a feel for the size, um, I know different people are part of different organizations, um, of around two to two and a half um, million US dollars per annum, um, to give you a bit of an idea of the size and scope. 
Um, the way AWB works in Australia is we have a national office team that's responsible for our um, programs and our overseas work and partnerships, and they're supported by, Australia, um, by region, um, they're kind of like chapters, um, regions, which are geographic um, collections of um, people, so in all the major cities, and then the universities have um, student level chapters. Um, so as mentioned, my role is heading up what we call the EWB Institute, um, which is the catch-all of our uh, education and research programs. Um, the reason why EWB Australia thinks this is so important is that um, while humanitarian engineering, uh, as we call it, is, a, is a, a niche, something that individuals can do, whether they're working on water supply projects overseas or um, working with First Nations communities, um, on technical challenges, what we feel is there's a really important role for sustainability and community development to be part of all engineers' um, kind of work. Um, so what we've decided is that by focusing, focusing on um, education, if we can engage students and have this as part of the curriculum, then everyone can engage with these skills and these projects and take them into their future career. Um, so some of the initiatives that we have that achieve this, one of the biggest programs we have um, is called the EWB Challenge, and that's a first year design program. So at the very start of your degree, when you're learning about what engineering is and what it's all about, um, what we do is we work with um, one of our community partner organisations, we choose a different one each year, um, and we come up with an engineering design challenge. Um, and what we'll do is we'll work with the community on design areas. So whether it's um, the community, for example, um, pictured there in the slide is uh, Cambodia. We work with the Cambodian community on the Tonle Sap Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. Um, really interesting context. These are floating villages, so communities that don't have a fixed location, um, that move during the wet season and the dry season and face a lot of challenges. So what happens is we work with um, Australian universities to put that type of content into curriculum. And what we see is that this program that around 8,000 students do each year um, is their first step towards a career in humanitarian engineering. As the students progress through their degree, there's lots of other ways they can get involved. They can join EWB as a member and be an active uh, chapter participant. Um, and there they can do things like uh, school outreach, going um, and working with schools across the country, um, talking about sustainability challenges. Um, the other program they can be involved with is our research initiative. So for EWB and where it fits in in the Australian curriculum, is that final, final year engineers um, have a project, a capstone project, and they can partner with EWB um, on a research program um, to meet the requirements of their degree while also coming up with some positive outcomes for the community. Um, one of the things I want to talk about from EWB, Australia's perspective with Jobs for Change, is our work with the corporate sector. One of the major um, uh, funding sources for EWB Australia, one of the major ways we achieve our outcomes is through the support of engineering, construction and design firms. So EWB Australia partners with um, some of the major um, consultancies in Australia um, and that's a um, partnership and collaboration which involves both resources but importantly people getting involved in our programs. So one of the ways we do that is connect corporate um, professionals to our work in the field through um, things like uh, study tour programs. So the picture there is um, a couple of professionals from uh, a mining company um, who spent three weeks in Cambodia on a, what we call our Dialogues on Development study tours. And there you're learning all about um, community development, uh, appropriate technologies, but importantly one of the outcomes always is um, some of the skills on human-centred design that the participants learn there, they can take back to their professional world. So I'll flag there that um, a lot of the people that are involved with EWB um, have um, traditional um, engineering roles, and what they've done is through participation with EWB, have kind of shaped how they go about they do what, um, doing what they do. Um, 
So they're not necessarily taking up a whole new role, but rather they're applying the skills from EWB's work into their into their roles. Um, professional study tours is one aspect um, of the work we do. Um, the other one that that is kind of increasing in our um, programs, which is also leading to more kind of um, jobs and professional opportunities, um, is the same aspect but with a research lens. So we run um, humanitarian design summits, and these are a multi-week program for engineering students to spend time with the community and learn about human-centered design while working with a community organization. Um, we've just finished up uh, recent trips um, over the uh, Australian winter the, um, with our partners in Cambodia, and what we did this cycle is take engineering academics so um, academics um, in the engineering sector in Australia often focus on a technical aspect. Through EWB, we're really trying to expand the number of individuals that are looking at humanitarian and community development projects. And one of the initiatives that we've done to help trigger that, to let people make this a career through research and through academia, is we de developed the Journal of Humanitarian Engineering. Uh, one of the issues with academia is that um, publication is really important for promotion, for tenure, um, and there was a bit of a gap, or we, what we saw was a bit of a gap in the literature for publishing research um, into these types of projects. So the Journal of Humanitarian Engineering is a peer-reviewed um, academic publication to give academics the chance to actually do this type of research, uh, get credit, and really um, shape their careers around it. And we're starting to see that um, really start to take off in Australia. Um, there's a newly launched um, humanitarian technology research group at the University of Adelaide, um, and some really great partners at the University of New South Wales in Sydney looking at water projects. Um, as an example of how academics and students do it, here's a neat picture from the Humanitarian Design Summit. Um, the context was the school community um, in Kep province. Um, the Sophia Sally School, as the name of the school, uh, hosted a group of research students, um, and they were kind of um, spent time with the principal and the teachers, uh, looking at design challenges. One of the issues there is that it's a coastal community. There's very limited um, fresh water, uh, particularly during the dry season. Um, what that's meant is that there's no real hand washing facilities at the school, um, and the school is very poor, living on. Um, uh, between one and ten US dollars a day. Um, so what the uh, um, participants came up with was a recycled kind of soft drink bottle, um, as you can see in the picture there, with holes in the bottom. And um, the reason why this kind of works is the cost of the design is probably um, a couple of cents. And the way that the toilets work at the school is that it's a poor flush toilet. So rather than pouring the water straight into the toilet, they can put it through this bottle, wash their hands, collect the water with the pan, and then flush the toilet. So you're not using any extra water. Um, the reason why I'm flagging this is one this project in a Careers for Change talk is the person in that photo, um, uh, Talia, has started a scholarship program with EWB. So even though she kind of undertook this in the start of her undergraduate degree, she's now got herself set up where there's a multi-year program where she'll be involved with EWB's uh, research programs, our chapter activities, um, and really put her in a good place that if she's interested in pursuing a program like this um, beyond her degree, that she's actually got some runs on the board, that she's um, really uh, done a variety of programs and built up her own skills. So what EWB Australia is trying to do is create pathways to actually create what is the next step to move me from where I am um, to where I want to be. Um, before I wrap up, there's a couple of things I want to touch on um, at uh, what some of the outcomes have been for EWB Australia, is we work quite closely with a lot of our other partner organisations. So um, what we're really trying to do is create um, mechanisms skills they've learned as a volunteer, as a chapter member, and move on to the next step. Um, some really great examples is um, we've got a, one of our incredibly keen and involved um, chapter members who his day job was um, working on electrical power projects in Sydney. His uh, work with EWB was being involved in chapters looking at education. 
So um, he's got technical expertise in one field. He's gained the community development um, uh, skills through his time at EWB, and he's recently taken up a role in the Marshall Islands where he's supporting power generation across the whole country. So it just kind of shows that um, when you add the technical expertise to kind of the range of um, soft skills that EWB provides, it sets you up for kind of future roles and future opportunities um, that, that kind of really overlap that sector. Um, that's really it from me. There's a couple of links there um, around EWB Australia um, to get a bit more of a feel there and um, one of the major events that um, EWB Australia hosts around design, technology and social change. Um, now that event um, also highlights kind of social enterprise and the ways that people can kind of craft their own careers um, in the future. We'd love to welcome anyone that wanted to come if they happen to be in Australia in March 2016. Um, but that's it for me um, until we get to the questions. But um, thanks a lot for listening and I'll hand it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Julian. All right, and our next speaker is Skip Spensley, who has had a really diverse career pathway as a lawyer, educator, project manager, um, and an environmental consultant. Uh, so I am not going to read his entire bio, but he is currently an acting uh, adjunct professor at the University of Denver and also a major lead at EWB USA. So Skip, over to you. Thank you for inviting us to participate in the uh, webinar this morning. Um, I will try to stick to my time here to get through a number of slides. Um, my slides have not come up yet, I guess. Maybe I just need to push it, okay. All right, um, <clears throat> we have, uh, let me just start by saying uh, we have a lot of challenges today as maybe an understatement uh, in the area of engineering and in world development. Um, as many of you already know, the challenge really begins with just some very basic kinds of needs that uh, all people have. Um, in, in this slide, you can see that we have literally uh, uh, more than a billion people who still don't have access to clean drinking water. And if you add the problems of sanitation to that as well, you probably have more than half the world's population that still suffers from some basic kinds of infrastructure uh, accommodations. Similarly, if you look at energy, which uh, is more and more a big subject today, uh, more than a billion and a half or a little less than a billion and a half people still don't have access to uh, basic electricity for uh, for living conditions. So they, many of those uh, communities and many of those um, members uh, use uh, traditional cooking methods of biomass energy. Um, the World Health Organization has estimated that uh, if we they continue to do that, the pollution from that could result in as many as a million and a half deaths per year uh, to those individuals by 2030. So the challenge from a standpoint of providing basic uh, uh, infrastructure for communities is clearly there. If you go to the next slide, uh, another kind of challenge which uh, is a little bit different is that of delivering education to, uh, to our students and to our population. These are some statistics that recently uh, were uh, developed that indicate that when we look at the cost of education, uh, this was astounding to me that between 1985 and 2013, which is roughly almost 30 years, we've seen the cost of our education increase by five-fold, while our consumer price index has only increased by a little over 120%. And even looking at medical costs where we clearly have uh, uh, a concern about rising costs, they've only been about half of what we've seen in the educational sector. When you combine that with the fact today that because of that, students are uh, having to take out loans almost 70% now in our universities, which amount to over a trillion dollars, uh, many of them on average graduate with a $30,000 debt, which is a stifling to a person's career trying to start out by um, developing uh, some professional expertise. 
Um, and you combine that also, I might add, with the fact that only about 60% of the college students today graduate within six years. Well, that means that 40% may never get a degree and still end up with a pretty significant debt uh, in our university structure. On account of those things, I think EWB USA and all EWBs uh, provide a very valuable uh, uh, service in giving engineers uh, some options in terms of developing some experiential learning, which is a key part of it. So when we look at EWB USA like the others, uh, we really have two principal missions. One is to build stronger communities. It's a humanitarian mission. And the other, of course, is to provide education to engineers graduating, giving them that uh, learning experience, which so much is needed now and is sought after by companies that are working in the global environment. So what are some of our programs? Well, first of all, a, a very critical part of our program is, uh, is, is uh, focused on doing these kinds of humanitarian projects. Uh, throughout the world, and these are community-driven projects. That is our model based on a partnership with the host community. Uh, when EWB USA chapters actually adopt a project, they make a five-year commitment to that community. So it is something that we think is sufficient to be able to not only help in resolving issues, but to be there to help educate the local community as to how to, for example, just maintain the kind of systems that may go in. As you can see from these statistics, we are pretty active throughout the world. Um, we have almost 15,000 members, at 200 and some chapters, uh, 250 chapters plus that uh, work in developing engineering projects, uh, oftentimes with the help of students other than engineering students. We sometimes have social science students, uh, uh, economic students, those that have other disciplines that they can bring to the table and help provide a kind of sustainable approach to the work that's, that's being done. Um, just as one example of that, this is a project uh, that was done by one of our professional chapters, the Lehigh Valley chapter, uh, that and in a partnership with the uh, Centennial Secondary School in Sierra, Sierra Leone, uh, helped build a school that had been destroyed earlier uh, during a civil strike. And they helped working with the community, uh, put together a new school that included even more uh, accommodations than had before, such as the sanitation, uh, facilities and electricity uh, to its water supply. And this is one example of, again, where a chapter has worked with a local community and it being community driven. This slide summarizes some of the program principles that we use in that, uh, again, as I mentioned, a, a very important part of this is ensuring that we don't go in and tell them what they need, but rather uh, they help us define the parameters of the kind of work that our chapters would be doing. A critical piece of that is in the early assessment stage where we will work with the, an NGO, uh, a community partner to help assess the needs, to verify what are the conditions in which um, the project will be constructed. That is often done in a, in a trip to that particular community for a number of days to do the assessment. Then there is a design stage and finally an implement state, the implementation stage where the work is uh, done by the chapter members who, by the way, also raise all the funding uh, to do these projects and to pay for their expenses as well as to acquire the materials uh, to construct whatever the project might be. And then finally, it's followed by a very important monitoring, evaluation, and feedback this is a, a newer part of the program we've developed over the last several years to ensure that not only are we doing what we promise to do and that we are doing it well from a standpoint of the technology, but also looking at what impact it has on the community 
and what the community has learned from the process so that they can learn to be more self-sufficient. What do we engineer? <clears throat> well, uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, almost three quarters of our projects involve either access to clean water or sanitation. And those are probably by far two of the biggest needs in developing communities. But we also engage in some agricultural product projects, uh, other civil works, uh, providing energy, information systems, and structures to a community as well. So who are we? Well, we, um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that we uh, rank very high in terms of our um, our approach to doing these kinds of projects in other countries is to think about how the experiential learning and the education that they, our students or young professionals get will help them in their own careers. So we abide by the ABET criteria, that's the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, and these are some of the outcomes that they are looking for today in terms of engineering education and the kinds of experience that engineers will get. And as you can see, it's much broader than just the technical side. It involves much of it dealing with things like simply learning how to communicate effectively or dealing with professional and ethical responsibility. And, la and lastly, in that group, uh, a knowledge of contemporary issues, particularly working in a global environment today. So how do we do that? Well, typically our students have to design a facility um, which meets either U.S. or international standards, construct it locally with available materials, use in most cases low-tech or appropriate tech uh, in order to develop solutions that the community can understand and employ, and finally to engage the stakeholders in that community uh, to understand the kind of sustainable solutions that we are trying to, to employ. So, in part, our members develop these kinds of skills, and I'm not going to read through the list, but you can see that these are the kinds of skills that not only um, are complying, if you will, with the ABET uh, uh, notions, but also the kind of experience that um, uh, employers are looking for in terms of engineers today that are have the kind of experience that they can go into the field and feel comfortable about dealing in, a, in an environment different than what they've been before. Lastly, I want to just mention very quickly, uh, we have just recently launched a certification program, or I should say we haven't launched it, we are doing a beta test on a certification program for global engineering and developing communities. Um, and we've done this because we believe that we want to provide an incentive to enhance our members' skills, and really to give them recognition as well as to their accomplishments, much of which, of course, they can accomplish during their education in the universities or colleges, but also as young professionals. And finally, um, hopefully enhance their qualifications by going through this uh, uh, certification process. The process basically is one of we have set some standards for what we believe are the uh, areas where engineers ought to have experience, and those become the certification requirements. Students, or I should say participants, can develop their own uh, approach to satisfying those requirements, taking some EWB USA courses or finding courses elsewhere. This uh, beta test we hope to conclude by the fall, and in 2016, if we can refine the program, we'd like to move forward with opening it up to anyone who might be interested. And lastly, I would mention as part of that, we will be seeking to work with various academic institutions um, in the U.S. that are normally associated with our chapters to be partners in that process. So that concludes um, my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer questions when we get to that. Thank you so much, Skip. That was very thorough, and we will have questions at the end, so if everybody can uh, thank your questions, and feel free to go ahead and include them in our Q&A uh, window. That would be great. Uh, and with that, I'd like to shift to Doug, uh, Doug Harper of UK, mm -hmm. who is the current acting CEO. 
and joined EWBUK in August 2014. He has a background in civil and structural engineering and international relations. And he originally began his career in the British Army, serving as a commissioned officer with the Royal Engineers. So um, I'd like to welcome you, Doug, and turn over the mic to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to take part in the webinar, and good afternoon to everyone that's listening. Uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Doug Harper. I'm the Chief Executive of Engineers at Borders UK, and I'm just going to start by saying that we talk a lot in the UK about being part of a global movement for change, and it's been great to hear from Skip and from Julian and to see so many synergies between really the philosophy behind what we're trying to do because it's so easy sometimes to operate in, in isolation when we're, we're all caught up in what we're doing day to day. But I really do think the Engineers Without Borders movement is united by a common belief that engineering should be about people rather than just an abstract application of maths or investing in technology for technology's sake. And that is certainly the line that we use here in the UK where we're promoting ourselves. I'm going to start by introducing myself. Uh, uh, Jan has covered much of it. Uh, I served for nine years in the Royal Engineers in the British Army and got a lot of experience of field engineering. I always refer to myself as an engineer by training rather than trade, because although I've got a uh, background in engineering, I've never, never done any what you would call proper structural work, building skyscrapers, or anything like that. But I have done a lot of low-level low -level projects, lots of wash stuff, lots of shelter, um, some emergency response stuff and things like that. When I left the Army, I left for a very specific reason, which was to go into development on a wider scale. And I did a couple of jobs before taking this one. One was for a private development firm in the Philippines, where we were introducing essentially commercial agriculture to one of the tribal communities out there. And then I worked in West Africa for a, a, an education NGO who worked to get people back into education after what there was a civil war. And yeah, as I say, I've been here uh, at EWB UK for just under a year now. I'll move on to talk about Engineers Without Borders UK in, in broad terms. And like many of the Engineers Without Borders associations around the world, we started off as a student society at one of the universities here in the UK and grown over the last 13 or 14 years to become uh, I would say a medium-sized nationally registered charity, so we're a little bit smaller than EWB Australia. Our turnover is just shy of two million US dollars each year. And we are at the moment transitioning really from being all about the students, if you like, to being about students and professionals as well. And what we're trying to do is create a globally responsible engineering profession. And I'll come on to what I mean by that a little bit more detail later. But my slides as well start off with some of the things that Skip was talking about in his presentation. So setting out really the, the why about the work that we do. So these are very similar statistics to, to the ones that Skip presented. So I'll just rattle through them very quickly. But lack of clean water, lack of access to sanitation, people not having enough food to eat and not having enough reliable energy access, really key issues facing the world as a whole. And I'm just going to speak a couple of moments on this last one, which is energy and electricity, because I think it's quite easy to dismiss this as almost a luxury somehow. But maybe after this webinar, if you've got the time, have a look on Google at two maps. If you look up GDP um, on, on a world scale, and then look up a picture of the world at night, which is admittedly a pretty crude representation of where there is power, but also a fairly realistic one. And it's almost a direct correlation between where people have access to energy and where there is wealth in the world. And we believe at EWB UK that really engineering underpins all the infrastructure needed for sustained economic growth to lift these communities out of poverty. And we work around that topic in two ways. One is our international work, which I'm going to talk about first, and then I'm going to come on to our education stuff a little bit later. So I wanted to talk first of all about two specific projects that we've done in the last 12 months. Each year we send away around about 30 recent graduates or early career professionals 
to add their technical skills to local NGOs. Quite a startling statistic is that in Northwestern Europe, we have around about 500 engineers for every 100,000 people. In the entire continent of Africa, there's one engineer per 100,000 people. So technical capacity is something that we really can add to these communities. We always work with local partners to ensure that what we're doing is driven by the community and not recognised by ourselves 6,000 miles away in an office in London. But I want to talk about one project, first of all, which is really to do with the statistic that I brought up about people not having enough to eat. And quite a depressing thought, and in fact there was some information about this in the British press this morning, is that there's actually plenty of food in the world. And there's enough to feed everybody uh, more than they need. One of the problems is that the supply chain between the farm and the market is not good enough, and that really comes down to infrastructure. So the two people you can see on the slide on your screen are George and Emma, and they were some EWV UK volunteers who worked out in Cameroon for six months just over Christmas, just gone, in a little town called Bamboo, which is in northern Cameroon, with one of our partners who are called Reignite. And their project was called Farm to Market, and they conducted, as graduate engineers, a, a series of consultations with the farmers in the local community, with the traditionally women who sell the produce. Uh, here's a picture of someone just visiting a farm, uh, and with the people that process the food. And the output of this project was a number of recommendations that Reignite could then go on to use, uh, which they're going to do so in a new project that's been funded by the lottery over the next three years to try and improve that supply chain. So that's, if you like, a sort of indirect use of engineering education for development. The next project that I want to talk about is in Kenya. And this is Kybera, or Kybera, depending on how you pronounce it. And for those of you who don't know, this is a slum that's just to the north of Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, and it's the biggest slum in sub-Saharan Africa. Huge place. And as you can see from that picture, if any of you visited this type of community pretty much the world over, you can see that there's a whole load of different problems associated with living in these conditions. So inadequate shelter, that lack of access to energy that I spoke about, not great sanitation, probably not that good access to clean water unless you have a lot of money. Um, and then more importantly, a, a lack of jobs, a lack of opportunities to generate income to get yourselves away from this community. So we've been working with an organization called KDI out in Kibera for the last three or four years. And we've been helping them to implement a project called Pro Productive Public Spaces. And what KDI and us do is we identify a region in Kibera, which is not being used for anything particularly productive, and we turn it into a productive space. So we go back and survey it, speak to the local community, install water supply, install sanitation, install electricity, and really provide a space that can be used by the local community that's not only safe and well lit, but also has an opportunity for them to engage in those income generating activities. And you can see in this last picture, before and after, what a difference it's making, both on the really local scale, specific to where the space has been created. And you can see on the right hand side there, all the different types of things that can happen in these productive spaces. So again, really excellent project that people who are involved with EWV UK can get involved in after they've finished their engineering education. To take a couple of steps back um, to talk about the vision of, of the organization that I have the privilege to represent, uh, we, and this is subject to change as we're about to review our strategy, but at the moment we uh, believe in a world where everybody has access to engineering the need for a life free from poverty. And we approach that vision or, or work towards that vision in, in two ways. Obviously that's a pretty grandiose statement and they mirror very closely EWB Australia particularly and equally EWB USA and that is we, we work to inspire engineers of the future to address global issues and we also work to support the engineers of today. So the, the projects that I just talked about are very much the support part and we also have a smaller program which is very similar to the EWB USA model where smaller groups of people go out and do shorter projects of a more limited scope. For example, one of our university chapters last year went out to Tanzania and installed a, a wind turbine on the side of a school 
there to provide them with power. That's the sort of member-led project scope that we that we deal with. But the inspirational part uh, is is perhaps the undersung hero of our organisation and becoming increasingly more important. I'm sure it's much the same in many of the countries that you're listening from, but in the UK we're we're facing a real crisis of supply for engineers in the future. And one of the reasons for that is that engineering education here only appeals to a very specific type of person. And what we're trying to do as engineers without borders is open people's eyes to not only these global issues that I've talked about already, but the fact that there's more than you can do with engineering education than just going into an engineering consultancy you know, or structural design and working on a site. So we have a number of education programs and, and luckily Julian's already talked about the challenge in some detail. So we run that as well. Um, we partner with EW Australia on that. We deliver that in about 30 universities around the UK at the moment. And I'll just pick up on Julian's last comment as well about creating pathways. So we call them learning journeys, but it's very similar, very similar concept. And for our learning programs, what we're trying to do is create a journey all the way through from school children age to uh, edu uh, you know, higher education and beyond. So we have a school outreach program which our members go out into the local community and they deliver workshops that illustrate to school children both the global problem and then equally that other part of what I was talking about where we're, we're telling people that engineering has other options than just engineering consultancy. Hopefully some of those kids will be inspired to go on to engineering degrees. We run the challenge, it's the same concept here as it is in Australia. We also have a project that we're just finishing up at the moment, um, which we've done with a, with a number of partners across Europe called GDEE, which stands for Global Dimension Engineering Education. And what we've targeted there is the people who are teaching these future engineers. And we're hoping that by targeting them as well, then they will incorporate this sort of global thinking, this, this concept of a global engineer into the whole of the curriculum and not just the, the specific areas that we can focus on with our programs. I'm going to finish as Julian did by just uh, talking about some of the outcomes that we've had from, from volunteers and people involved with, with our organization. And I think it's worth making the point that we're very realistic about the fact that not everybody that gets involved with engineers like Borders is going to go on to become a development professional. But that's actually okay because if we can create people who are aware of this concept, who, are, who go into the engineering consultancy or go in and to finance and all the other things that engineering graduates do, then, then we're, we're quite happy that we're doing what we set out to do. But at the moment, we've got several ex-EWB volunteers who've gone on to do fantastic things in the development sector. So a very recent volunteer for us who went on one of our placements a couple of years ago is now working for Medicine Sans Frontier in South Sudan. We've got a board member who was previously a member of staff at EWB, who heads up the emergency shelter team at Care International. And we've got other ex-volunteers who work for Concern and also who work for PLAN. But I think I'm just going to finish by emphasizing that point that it's okay if you get involved with us and then go on to do something different. We also have a huge amount of success with people, particularly young students who have been involved going on to win national awards. This year we've had three of our EWB student members win nationally recognized prizes and they've all attributed some of that to having this broader perception of engineering that hopefully Engineers Without Borders has played a part in. Uh, thank you very much and I'd be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I think it's critically important that you ended on that note regarding uh, the broad nature of engaging in global development as an engineer and uh, the perspective that is going to ultimately benefit you through your career generally. So uh, here at U4C, we're very happy and, and part of our mission is to really support and advance the important work of groups like EWB USA, EWB UK, and EWB Australia by building this pipeline of engineers who engage with the organizations exposing your work and providing this platform for us to really talk about some of our lessons learned collectively to bring you all to this virtual table, if you will, to, to have these conversations. 
So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, just to, to get your perspectives. And then I invite uh, our attendees to type in their questions into our Q&A window uh, for the presenters if you have some very specific questions. So um, the first uh, question I'd like to ask, and um, we've heard about the various differences that uh, you all have taken in similarities and, and the approaches to development across education, across the project work, and so forth. What would you say are the key professional practices or skills that uh, really you emphasize uh, highly through your projects and programs? And I'm going to, because you guys can't see me, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, name names in terms of getting uh, folks to answer. So why don't we start with Skip, and then Julian, then Doug. Well, I think it was um, Doug or Julian who said, and I apologize not remember which, that and a really critical part of one of the skills that I think is important for our students and young professionals that work through EWB is to have that opportunity to work with a community, with the people on the ground, to help them define the needs that they have, to work with them and teaching them about solutions, um, working in a context in which the challenge for us, uh, for thus uh, us coming from a different culture is understanding and communicating. So to me, that's one of the most critical pieces of, uh, of this experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And Julian? Um, so, Julian? How's that now? Um, there we go. We can hear you. <laughs> um, so one of the skills I think is most important for our chapters and members, and it really comes back on our approach, is that, um, look, a lot of times people think of engineers without borders, and they think that it's around um, kind of the practical aspect of doing engineering, or building something, or of introducing new technology. But in reality, EWB, Australia's work, is really around technical capacity building. It's not our job to to build a well, build a bridge, but rather to work with our community partners and build their um, technical expertise to be able to do that. So I think that the skills that are really essential kind of for the people that are doing this work is the ability to communicate well, to, to work with um, patience and respect and humility um, across cultures, um, and to be a teacher, to be a trainer. So um, because that's such an important skill, it's one of the reasons why EWB Australia um, put so much emphasis on our education programs, because that, to be honest, is one of the skills that our members will need to do this type of work and do it well. Very good. And Doug? Yeah, I agree with both Skip and Julian, actually. I'm not sure how much value I'm going to add with this, with this comment. But I think here in the UK, and I think it's probably the same in the States and in, in Australia, Traditional engineering education is very good at teaching the technical ability to solve problems. What it's not so great at doing is teaching people to think in social context or to represent social context and to listen to what what people actually need. So we have a, a bit of a running joke in the office, which is an engineer's approach to any problem is that there's definitely a solution. And if there isn't a solution to half the problem, there'll be a solution to the two smaller problems. And, and a lot of what we try and try and inform, I guess, rather than try and teach, is that uh, sometimes there isn't a solution. And, and a lot of these problems are so complex that many of the solutions in inverted commas are part of a wider solution and not the solution in itself. Mm -hmm. Very good feedback. So uh, you all naturally, uh, through your presentations, shared examples of some of the work that your members have been doing. And I, I think it's always exciting to have tangible uh, kind of ideas of how people have uh, shaped their careers. Some of those examples stem from, you know, the educational work or from kind of members who are on the younger side of the equation, if you will. Maybe you can share, if, uh, if any come to mind, uh, some examples of career pathways uh, for mid-career or even senior professionals that have engaged in your specific organizations. Um, and anybody can feel free to grab that question. Um, I'm happy to kick off. Um, there's a, a lot of, this is a somewhat new sector, um, this field of humanitarian engineering. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a really exciting time. Um, and I think that a lot of people doing with some of the most interesting careers in this space 
are people that are kind of going out and doing it themselves. Um, so look, one of our um, colleagues and some of her um, uh, friends started an amazing organisation called Pollinate Energy. Um, and what Pollinate Energy does, it's a social enterprise um, that's based in India um, that does, um, their real skill is around distribution and networks. So working with urban poor or slum communities um, and selling products. And they kicked off with solar lights um, and have kind of since branched out into a few, a few other products. Um, but that was a new program. So they had done some work at EWB and been involved with other organisations and they kicked that out, off and saw, saw there was a real need there. Um, so I guess that I'd urge people that um, to not necessarily look for a job description, but to make the most interesting jobs. And you could do that in a big company, is just say, hey, look, we're a massive company. How come there's not a, um, a community impact and engineering role? I think it could do this. Um, and I'd urge people to kind of create the jobs, whether it's within their company, within their institution, um, or start something new, because that's where the exciting stuff's happening. Mm. Great. Doug or Skip? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So I think uh, I mentioned this at the start of my, my set uh, just a minute ago. We're, we're only just starting really to concentrate on involving professionals in what we do. So that's a bit of a cop-out answer. Um, in, in terms of giving you specific examples, but I don't see why there's any reason why a, a mid-career professional or someone approaching retirement can't contribute exactly the same things as someone who's just graduated. Uh, and in fact, often has perhaps a little bit more experience um, to, to add to the party, if you like. Um, but if, if we can change the way that mid-career professionals think as well, and they're often in positions within within engineering firms where they could have an influence on local procurement, for example, um, what building materials they use and the embodied energy within them, things like that. You know, this is all going towards the same same set of problems with uh, around the world, same set of global challenges. So I, I think there's definitely scope for the engineers of that broader community to, to broaden its appeal. Um, and I think probably speak for most of us when, when I say that we're sort of transitioning towards that now and away from the student, student exclusively student focus anyway. Thank you. And Skip? I'm not sure if uh, Skip, uh, if you have any examples you want to share specifically. I'm sorry, I was on mute, forgive me. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to follow up on Doug. Um, in saying that uh, there's a phrase that I like that was uh, recently in part of a book written by David Brooks, who was a writer for the New York Times. He said, when we're young, we work on our resumes. When we're older, we work on our eulogies. And I think the idea that um, as we do get more advanced in our career and in, in our age, we begin to think about ways in which we want to contribute more to the to the broader good of humanity. And I think EWB, uh, any of the organizations where we can tap the experience um, of engineers who've been in the profession for a long time, who are natural mentors to our students, um, we should take advantage of that. And uh, in that regard, um, EWB USA has launched two new initiatives. One is a community engineering core, which is uh, using uh, our professional capabilities, uh, our engineers, to work on local projects that uh, can't be done by um, the, the commercial side. And also a, another part of our program dealing with um, engineering services that we offer globally, which again are professional engineers with a great deal of experience who kind of provide some consulting uh, support for uh, both developing communities but also uh, governments that need the help of uh, professional engineers. Absolutely, that's really helpful. So we, we're getting close to time, so I want to make sure that we get at least one participant question, and I'm going to ask a couple or maybe one more question, and we will go over uh, a little bit. Uh, but uh, the one question that came up is, have there been instances where EWB USA, EWB UK, and EWB Australia organizations have collaborated um, with work on the ground or elsewhere? Perhaps uh, you all have some that come to mind? 
I'll uh, I'll take first spin on that one if you like. So we mm -hmm. we collaborate EW UK and EW Australia collaborate on the challenge as as I and Julian mentioned I think in our in our presentations, and we also talk about other things which haven't come to fruition yet, but hopefully will do in the next couple of years. And, and we talk a lot with EW Canada too. Um, I have. I have been on the ground with EWB USA volunteers as well, um, but I think, I mean, Julian Skip might jump in with, with different opinions, but I think at the moment, on the ground collaboration is probably quite quite thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this is Skip. I would add also, there's a relatively nascent organization called EWB International, where we are trying to bring together the various EWBs around the world and exchange information and experiences. So I think there is a, a broader interest in, in global collaboration to uh, share our successes, but also importantly to share our failures. And um, I find as a teacher that failures are more instructive often than successes. Well, I'm glad you said that, Skip, because the very next question for us was around failure and um, specifically how it is integrated into the professional development work that you all carry out. Well, I would just add to that. I mean, we, we do focus and ask for uh, feedback and lessons learned after each of our chapters do a project. And we do ask about failures because uh, it helps point out the weaknesses in our process and in our approach. And we have found over time that one of the areas that is uh, most lacking, I think, and that the one I mentioned earlier in my presentation, is really getting a sense of what the community needs are, who are the key stakeholders in the process, and how do we ensure that we're meeting their needs and not what we think ought to be done. Mm -hmm. um, just to expand on that, one of the things that Engineers Without Borders Australia does um, it was in addition to failure, it was, um, kind of challenge the a lot of the kind of concepts in what we're doing and how. So during our study tours, for example, um, we we look at different development models um, and what some of the benefits and what some of the challenges are. Um, there's a really great, really fantastic piece called "To Hell with Good Intentions," um, which was um, basically basically a, a, a kind of diatribe about how this concept of um, in this context it was American, um, but it was applied all probably kind of um, Western countries um, going into a different country without expertise. So we um, deliberately expose our um, members and have quite complex chats about what we do and how we do it. Um, I think that really strengthens the organisation, is, is being a bit um, introspective and going, um, why are we doing this? What's the best way to do it? And is it really having the impacts that we hope it will? Um, all right. And uh, we are, we're approaching time, so I'm going to uh, ask you a more aspirational question. Um, and uh, maybe each of you can share your view on this, and I'll start with Doug, then Skip, then Julian. How do you see engineering for global development or humanitarian engineering or global engineering, it seems first step is to actually get some sort of standard nomenclature, but how do you see this field evolving as a profession in the next 10 years? Well, that's a big question to end <laughs> the end of the webinar. <laughs> I think so this is my view rather than an organizational view, but I think we're probably going to see a move away from traditional charitable endeavor. Uh, that's already starting to happen with with the, with the rise, if you like, of social enterprise. But correspondingly, I think we're probably going to see more and more traditional businesses become more social. And I think that's going to be driven both by external factors like climate change, but also from inside, so from the from the ground roots upwards. Uh, you know, uh, ideology is traditionally stronger in, in the younger people. And I think as engineering firms struggle to recruit people, uh, because there's fewer and fewer people coming through engineering education, they're going to have to cater, if you like, to the views of those people that they're recruiting. And, and we see it all the time now with people who have been involved with our organization who are challenging potential employers 
asking what that CSR policy is, asking you know the, the, the things that Julian was just mentioning there, you know, introspective ethical questions, where they work, why they work, and how they work. So I think the development of the global engineering development profession, whatever we're going to call it, it it's probably going to look a, very different. But I, I suspect and I hope that what we'll see is more traditional engineering firms becoming more globally focused. Amen to that. Uh, Skip, you want to add? No, I, I, I would just endorse uh, what Doug said. Um, the one thing I would add to it is uh, maybe, again, this is a personal opinion, um, there's uh, been doing a lot of reading about technology and the exponential growth and what we are going to have as tools available to us in the next decade or two. And I think it's important that we don't let that overshadow the idea that appropriate technology still plays a critical role in working with 90% of the world's problems that we deal with. And I think engineering companies in the past and continue to deal with, want the big projects, the Panama Canals, but it is going to be working at the local level that all of us do that is going to make the most uh, significant contribution, I believe, in the future. Thank you. And to round it out, um, I'll just touch on the uh, education side of things. Um, in the year 1970, there was only an engineering degree um, in the world that, that had sustainability kind of in it. Um, and now it's in almost every, or it is in Australia, in every single engineering degree. Um, I think we're kind of at that tipping point for the um, social and community parts of engineering. So I think it'll uh, turn out in two ways over the next 10 years. One is that every single engineering will start to touch on uh, community engagement, impact of um, uh, like what, what engineers can do for disadvantaged communities. Um, the second one will be the professionalisation of humanitarian engineering or engineering for global development. So in the way that you can graduate with a mechanical engineering degree now, um, in 10 years there will start to be cohorts of people that have done a Bachelor of Engineering um, in, in global development. These are all fantastic pathways and we're really looking forward to them being realized over the next 10 years and even sooner. So with that, I, I do apologize. We, we have reached time. We've gone over time and I, and I want to thank all of our panelists as well as all of our attendees for joining us today. It's been a fantastic discussion. If we didn't tackle your question, please feel free to send us an email at the address you see listed on the slide in front of you, webinars at engineeringforchange.org, and we'll be happy to pass them on to the presenters or connect you directly. Um, as uh, on behalf of E4C, we are here to facilitate more of these kinds of conversations, drive dialogue, and ensure that uh, uh, good folks like yourselves are, are doing good work on the ground and in, in and your firms and in every pathway that makes sense. So thank you so much. We will definitely see you all, hopefully see you all in September. And take care. Have a good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Take care.